to episode seven of Community Talks. Uh, we're here today with Ann Malone. Uh, now, Ann Malone, we've had it again before, before Community Talks, but called Community Talks. Uh, we had uh, an event called Him Visiting an Inclusion City. And if you want to see that video, uh, make sure to check it out on our Facebook group, uh, Accessible Now. So without further ado, uh, let's meet in. Hello, Anne. How are you doing today? Hi, Josh. I'm very well, thank you. And I'm so pleased to be here. Well, I'm pleased to have you here. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. I know you always have a lot on the go and I always got something to say and just like myself. So. <laughs> I think this is going to be a good interview. So uh, let's start with question number one. Tell me about yourself. Okay, I am visually impaired. I move through the world with my guide dog, Cheryl. Uh, my visual loss happened in about 2007, 2008, that sort of time frame quite suddenly and it was an interesting experience in that I really experienced a big contrast mm. in status from being a person who appeared to be um, in every way typical and now I am perceived to be a person who may not be as able as other people. And I, I just want to emphasize perceived to be, as opposed to actually is. And um, like I found that employment opportunities were much more difficult to access. Um, the city became much more difficult to move through for me. Um, there were a lot of big changes that went along with that sight loss. And um, it was a very rough time that lasted a little over a year for me to wrap my mind around what was happening. Um, but it really left me with um, a, a resolve to try to make things better um, in our society for other people who experience those same things. So um, in 2012, my daughter actually organized the first protest at City Hall about the poor snow clearing in St. John's. And that was the first time I actually got engaged in um, activism related to sidewalk accessibility. Um, and at that time, of course, I realized there were a lot of other people in St. John's who were struggling with the same um, access that people with disabilities do, especially in the wintertime, uh, because anybody who is a pedestrian, anybody who doesn't, you know, have a vehicle at their disposal all the time in St. John's experiences inaccessibility. Um, so that was kind of my threshold into um, accessibility advocacy. And then it has just continued and accelerated from then. And I'm, I became much more kind of linked and had opportunities to cultivate friendships with people within the disabilities community. Uh, because my experience was up until maybe three or four years ago that because of the inaccessibility, it can be difficult for us to all congregate in the same place at the same time. Uh, but also just the way that systems have evolved over the years. Um, many of us are linked with or receive services from organizations. And, you know, there might be one for blind folks and another one for people who are deaf and another one for people who have disabilities that require them to use wheelchairs as an accessibility. There were sort of all these little communities um, and it was kind of like I, it was just difficult to connect with other people who, who were experiencing some of the same things I experienced and to kind of create 
a real community, you know, where we all kind of get to know each other and have common purpose, um, common challenges, and can learn from each other and support each other. And one of the great things about Accessible NL is it provides a platform um, to do that. Uh, with my joining Accessible NL when the when the community first launched on Facebook, that was really my first opportunity to to hear from people who use wheelchairs or to hear from people who are deaf or even from other people who are visually impaired or blind people who have autism people who have mental illness or people who have um, neurodiversity so like accessible nl has really served a really wonderful purpose in that respect and um, the more I learned, the more I realized how profound inaccessibility has on the lived reality of people who have disabilities. My mission is to do anything I can to amplify this issue among the, the general public, um, but also to encourage and help mobilize other people who have disabilities who may have just been waiting for the connections and the opportunities to do so. That's fantastic. I can, uh, I can actually relate to what you mean by uh, learning about other people, their struggle with their disability. Uh, when I started Accessible Now, to be honest, um, I started it because of the problem that I had, because of the problem that I knew about. And I knew a lot of other people in wheelchairs also experienced the same problems that I had when getting around the city and whatnot. But once I started it, more and more different people with different disabilities came on board and I'm, I'm thrilled about that. But in doing so, I've learned a lot myself and I'm still learning to this day about all different people and different disabilities and different things can, they can be done in the city to make it easier for these individuals to live and get around in the city. So I never imagined it becoming what I had today, but I'm really glad that it is. But I, I do notice that there was little communities here and there and uh, it kind of didn't really come together and uh, in a way no i don't really know if i should use that word but i feel like in a way and it wasn't intentional but i feel like it would kind of in a way segregate it like, yep <laughs> they, you know everyone had their own little clicks Kind of remind me of a kind of remind me of high school, you know. Everyone got their own little cliques, and they explored their own little things and their own little community, but they never go beyond that. So I'm excited to be able to bring everyone together and trying to make it better for uh, a lot more people and just people in wheelchairs. Because at the end of the day, when people think disability automatically, in, in my experience, they usually think about someone in a wheelchair, but it's more than that. As you know yourself, like you said, the, the seeing impaired and the hearing impaired and people with autism, and we all got to come together to get, get the job done. So I'm really, I'm really excited that it's become what it's become today. So, Absolutely. Uh, I'm really happy to have you on board from the beginning. Uh, so uh, my next question is, uh, I've heard, or you've told me that you were r running for council. That's correct. I'm wondering if you could tell me a little more about that. Sure. Um, the first thing I'll tell you about that is that if someone had told me I would be doing this two years ago, I would have said that they were mad. <laughs> it's not something I ever considered. However, 
Um, the more that I've learned about the importance of representation at the table where decisions are made, um, the more I began to see that it was necessary for people from our community, not only me, but like anybody who feels drawn to do this, to step out and, and claim the space and, and make a run for it. Because, you know, I've observed, especially over the past few years, um, I've been watching the city council meetings and, you know, the meetings of the committee of, as a whole. And um, there hasn't been anybody who self-identifies publicly anyway, um, with a disability on council for many years, um, probably, probably a couple of decades. And as with, particularly when it comes to the built environment and public spaces, including roadways and sidewalks and buildings, um, we, if you live with a disability, you have a completely different perspective on how things are built, how decisions are made, the impacts that will, it will have on, on you and on other people who have disabilities. Um, and I didn't, although I heard pretty much all of our counselors speak at length about their support of accessibility, I watched as over and over again, they voted against spending money to make accessibility a reality. And, you know, that disconnect was really upsetting to me. Um, it caused me to lose faith in some ways in the process. Um, and I, I just believe that the disabilities community needs a voice at the table where the voting is happening. And I also, from my friendships and acquaintances um, in the disabilities community, I, you know, the things that I hear most frequently when we talk about these things, and even sometimes in the comments on, on, um, on the Facebook page, um, I hear most frequently things like, nobody's listening to us, nobody cares. Yes, they're saying it, but will they really do it? You know, this sense of, of disappointment and being very demoralized and discouraged because of the difficulties and the struggles that we've had in, in making Newfoundland and Labrador as accessible as any other province. So those are all the reasons and those are all the things that informed my decision to run for the city, uh, for city council. I'm not a person who, like I have nothing to lose. Um, and I will speak the truth <laughs> and I don't have a problem with challenging um, what I consider to be ableist um, perspectives. And I don't mind sort of you know, respectfully interrupting a conversation to introduce another point of view. And like, just as an example, very often when we, you know, as a big community, as the citizens of St. John's, talk about downtown St. John's and how inaccessible it is, especially for people who have wheelchairs, but to all of us as well, um, who have disabilities, in some respect, it is, it is um, inaccessible. You know, and usually when people talk about that, they're talking about people with disabilities not having opportunities to socialize downtown, to spend their money downtown, to enjoy the amenities of downtown. And all of that is true and, it's, and it is wrong. However, another way to look at it, which is a, another very sobering look, is that the downtown area represents one of the zones in the city where there is a high concentration of employment. So if the area is inaccessible, that is a high concentration of unemployment that is now inaccessible to people who have disabilities. So all of these things, like the dots always connect, right? Like, um, 
the accessibility of our city actually does play a role in us having access to things like employment. It actually impacts us in ways that are far more serious than whether or not you can go to a particular store to purchase something or go to a particular venue to hear live music or whatever. It's a really good point, Sarah, and this is why I, uh, I think we get along really well. We, we mean you, we can speak the truth, and we don't hold back, and we'll say whatever we're going to say. So I'm really looking forward to uh, having you a part of this in the future. So I think it's very much needed. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. I feel like people, if they don't have a disability, or if they don't have anyone in their life with a disability, then the odds are they're not really thinking about disability issues. So if you got a whole culture of people and no one has a disability, then obviously they're, they're not really thinking about uh, the needs of the disability communities. So I'm really excited to know that you're uh, you're running for council, and I wish you all the luck and really hope you get in there. But we definitely need people like you to be uh, to be on that council for sure. Thank you. And you know, whether I win or whether I lose, the campaign alone will amplify this issue. So that's a win for the community either way. And the other thing I hope is that by by stepping into this and, and like claiming the space, right? That will inspire other people from this community to consider doing the same in the future. Because there are many people in this community who are very competent, very knowledgeable and very necessary. We need to hear from a variety of voices and it needs to be in every level of government, in every boardroom. That's what representation is. So exactly. that's my hope. <laughs> well, yes, it's my hope too, to be honest with you. Um, I think you know, I heard of someone else. I don't know. I think you know Brenda Walsh? Yes. Yes. Well, uh, Brenda is also running uh, for NDP. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. I was aware of that. Um, and like, that's so phenomenal. And, you know, um, when that campaign was happening, there was still snow on the ground and mm. Brenda uses a wheelchair. So like that kind of tenacity, I cannot imagine how difficult that must have been. Um, but that kind of tenacity and just, like I said, claiming the space, you know, we are a necessary part of our political fabric. We really are. Because if you stop to think about it, like everybody, everybody is facing some mobility challenge at some point in their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, if you are fortunate enough to live into your senior years, the body sort of degenerates um, as we age. And people may begin to use a cane or to have arthritis or this or that. All of the, like accessibility is great for everybody. If, yeah. um, if a person who does not have a disability has a surgery or breaks a leg or, or you know, injures themselves, they may be temporarily disabled and temporarily need crutches or a wheelchair or whatever. Mm. And, you know, um, I never... Most I, I never considered when I was a, a younger person before this happened to me that it might happen to me. And here I am. Disability can happen to anybody. Sometimes it's a permanent thing. Sometimes it is a temporary thing. You know, you injure yourself or you have an accident or whatever, and you may require certain accommodations. But an accessible city benefits everybody. Um, it is not only for people who have disabilities. It's always a better place. An accessible place is always a safer, more inclusive place. Yeah, exactly. I couldn't have said it better myself. Funny you bring that up, because I was going to bring that up after this 
uh, then people don't often realize that the uh, population uh, is, uh, is an older one. And we're only going to get older. And but with age comes disability problems. So uh, before you know it, we're going to have a whole province full of older people that are just not able to get out and enjoy the city like they used to when they were younger. So it's not just about people who are disabled now, but it's also about people who are going to be disabled or impaired in the future. So and it's very well said. So my next question for you is, uh, well, I know you have a lot to say about this question for <laughs> sure. Um, how do you find the accessibility around St. John's for uh, the seeing impaired? I find it very poor, honestly. Um, as you know, I work with a guide dog. A, like in the winter, for example, um, the guide dog guides me by watching to see where the curbs are. So if she cannot actually see a curb, she doesn't know what to do. She's mm -hmm. looking for that line, as an example. Mm -hmm. So winter as you know, can be as long as five months here. Um, so that's, you know, that's almost half your life. Um, so there's that. I also find that, you know, in St. John's, particularly in the older parts of the city, there are a lot of public stairways, <laughs> you know, in all the little alleyways downtown have yeah. stairways, concrete stairways that go from Duckworth Street to Water Street. Um, those stairways are incredibly dangerous to people who do not have depth perception or cannot see the steps. And um, as you know, Josh, last September, a crowd of us got together and we made those stairways accessible with chalk Excuse by you. putting a yellow stripe along the edge of each step, which is the accommodation. Um, of universal design for that particular situation. As we were doing that, people, you know, just the public who were out and about on a, on a beautiful Sunday afternoon got involved and like, what are you doing? And why are you doing it? And oh my gosh, that's amazing. And then I started to hear, um, you know, other people who, who were telling me, oh, my dad has Parkinson's disease and he actually finds it really great for his balance if those yellow stripes are in place, it would make all the difference to him or somebody else who had a brain injury basically saying the same thing. So it's amazing how one small inexpensive thing can make a huge difference in the quality of somebody's life. Um, the other thing is that as a person with sight impairment, like my biggest hurdle actually is traffic. Um, and St. John's is, you know, we have a lot of narrow streets, we have a lot of big vehicles, we have a lot of drivers, um, and a lot of congestion in some areas of the city. So we have many, many pedestrian crossings in the city. But the last time I asked the question of City Hall, which was about a year ago, I called to ask how many audible crosswalks were in St. John's. I was told there were 16. So I don't know how many there are in total, but my guess that 16 is a tiny percentage of the overall number of pedestrian crossings there are in the city. So my footprint on the city is actually very small. I stick to the downtown area because I feel safe downtown and I know it like the back of my yeah, hand. 16 is definitely not enough. I go around the city a lot too and I use the crosswalks and I noticed that, and I think it's because of COVID, uh, on a lot of these buttons, there's a sign that says no need to press the button because it's now automatic. And I thought to myself, oh, that's pretty cool, it's automatic. 
But then once it goes off, I realize there's no sound. There's nothing there to indicate that you're able to cross. Uh, other than the little man in the sun. And yeah. if you're someone like yourself, I imagine that's obviously not very easy for you to see. So I, I even noticed some of them at one point had a noise. And then uh, later on, like maybe a month or so later, they no longer have a noise. So I feel like They've taken some of them down. Can you think of any reason why anyone would want to get rid of that noise? So interesting you bring that up. Okay, so uh, very close to me, you know, to where I live, there is an audible crosswalk at the bottom of Kanaz Hill. About two years ago, the city purchased a software program that is actually a really good product. It's called Key to Access. And the idea is that the user can download an app onto their smartphone or use a lab, one or the other, to activate this software so that it will produce an audible crossing signal. Mm. I have attempted to use that crosswalk many times and have only had it actually work effectively a couple of times. Um, one of the issues that I had with it was that the intersection that I'm talking about is extremely noisy. There's a lot of industrial traffic. There's a lot of wind, just the acoustics there. It's a lot of traffic, traffic noise. And the first thing that happens when you activate this software is an aud a voice will, an audible instruction will be given to you. It will tell you where you are. And based on how that information is given to you, you have a second step, which is to press button number one or button number two on your lab to activate the audible signal. But you can't hear those instructions. So I called um, somebody at the city to sort of say to them, you need to increase the volume on this crosswalk. Um, and they, they agreed that they would, and they sent a worker, and I offered to walk over and be there, which they said no wasn't necessary, and an adjustment was made, and it still wasn't loud enough. Um, and I guess my point is, if it doesn't work for the end user, then it doesn't work. Yeah. And if they're not maintained properly, we can't trust them at all. We need to know every single time it's going to work or someone is going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. And people just won't trust it. Um, the other thing is, as you pointed out um, at the beginning of asking me this question, you said that you approached um, you approach the pole and you saw a sign that said that the button wasn't working, that you should just wait and the thing and the lights will change automatically. Well, yeah, well, no, it's just a click and you know, it wasn't working. The button was, it, it said, no need to press the button anymore because it's automatic. My point is, that's great if you're sighted, but if you're not sighted, you're not even going to see that. So you're going to stand there pressing, pressing, pressing not knowing what's going on, um, unless you have access to internet, et cetera, um, to get that information. Um, and we now know, like one of the things we've learned from Snowmageddon and the pandemic is that a lot of people who may not have the financial resources to have internet. So I believe that the city has to, to use other ways to communicate these things to people as well. Mm. For sure. No, I, it, just, it strikes me at all that like you offered to be there to help them out. And they refused. They said, no, no need for you to be there. Uh, but there is a need for you to be there. But, but if, you're, if you're up in the volume, 
on the device so someone like yourself is able to hear it, then you need to be there. That's another example of having more people with disabilities uh, in the workforce. Absolutely. Uh, so it just blows my mind and they say, no, it's fine. We don't need you. And as a matter of fact, they do. They do need you there, which is shocking. I can't, can't imagine the frustration you must have felt when they said no. But correct me if I'm wrong, but they said no, we don't need your help. We don't need you to be there. And you probably thought to yourself then, if you're not there, it's not going to be done right. Am I am I right to assume that? Uh, I certainly knew that was a possibility. <laughs> yeah, it's a possibility. Yes. Okay. Well, <laughs> you mentioned you mentioned a device called a lob. What do you think is a lob? It's a little handheld object um, that you can charge. Uh, so it has two or three buttons on it, and depending on what you want, what direction you want to go at an intersection, you press one one of those buttons. Oh. Um, and you know, a lot of people, especially like I do not want to download an app on my smartphone that I have to use in all kinds of weather to try to cross the street because one I, I'm one handed basically hands used up by just holding my guide dog's handle, right? Mm -hmm. um, and smartphones, like it's a thousand dollar phone. If I drop it on the sidewalk or if I drop it in snow, now I'm on my hands and knees trying to find a smartphone or try to replace it. So the, the lob mm -hmm. was the better um, option for me. And um, if anybody watching wants to access one of these labs, you can uh, get them, I think, either from the city or from CNIB, and they are free mm. of charge. Free They're of charge. Also, wow. They might be really useful also for people who use wheelchairs, because um, you don't actually ever have to touch that button on a pole, mm. right? You can just roll up to the curb and press a button on that lob. So you don't even have to worry about maneuvering around to get to the pole, because I know sometimes that's an issue as well. Yes, um, it's an issue that is far too common. Uh, I've been told that myself, my chair is a monster truck. Uh, <laughs> and even with my chair, there's still some buttons that are uh, not accessible for me, because they're not, they're either up too high or yeah. the drop between the sidewalk and the pole. And I'm just left there waiting to see if the, if the crosswalk could change. And depending on the crosswalk, it might not even change. It might not be one of the automated ones. It might be one where you need to press the button. So I, I might look into that myself, to be honest. That does sound like a really nifty device. It is, and if like if the whole system is maintained properly and calibrated properly, um, I think it's it's like a genius solution. Um, but I also think that you know the volume should be higher in higher in noisier places. Um, I don't know what's going on if they have them all at the same volume level, no matter where they are. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the issue is uh, with keeping them appropriately calibrated and programmed. But I'm gonna find out. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, this sounds like a really interesting device. You gotta check that out. I might get one for myself. Maybe yeah. somehow leave it on my wheelchair or something. Um, and another thing about that is with the coronavirus, you don't really want to be touching the buttons anyway. Exactly. Right, and so to have your own little personal device on you will be a lot easier. Uh, what about looking at it myself? So my next question for you, and we kind of already touched on it a little bit, but you're welcome to 
expand on it. Uh, what exactly do you think St. John can do to address the accessibility issues that we have discussed here today? Um, I think there are a couple of things we can do. I think the first thing is something that we raised at um, our vigil on the International Day of Persons with Disabilities last December. One of the things that we asked was that from that time going forward, every public space, every public building in St. John's be approached with a universal design approach. So that would include considering wheelchair accessibility, sight accessibility, hearing accessibility, and neurodiversity accessibility. We, our community should not be in a position where we are competing for attention and money. And I feel that I, I feel that that might happen, right? Because we keep getting told that resources are scarce. So you have a variety of people who have a variety of needs, all trying to get their needs met. Mm -hmm. And so what may happen is you might have um, something that's site accessible, but not wheelchair accessible or something that's not that's wheelchair accessible, but not accessible to another group. And that won't happen if we approach, if we have that universal design approach. Let's get all of the elements that are required for all of the people in this space. Mm. And um, I had a conversation recently with someone I know you're very close to, and that's the Vicki Morgan. And uh, Vicki raised something that I just thought was a stroke of genius. And it was that wouldn't it be amazing if, if every neighborhood in the city could be audited for accessibility? And then wouldn't it be amazing if that information was used, first of all, to inform the city so we can make a plan as to how, how to raise the accessibility levels all over the city. But also, you know, if you're looking for an apartment or a home and you're on Kijiji or, you know, on real estate websites or whatever, you might notice that every neighborhood now comes with a walking score. Wouldn't it be amazing if every neighborhood had an accessibility score? That would be awesome. Wouldn't that be something? And it's yeah. so doable. And also it gives, you know, from, from the city's perspective, it gives them a real and true picture of where, where the, the weaknesses are and where the gaps are and, and where the most serious deficits are mm -hmm. so that we can, again, I keep saying, we need to have, have a formulated plan we, we know that um, we're probably, because of the economic situation that the province is in, of course, municipalities will also be strapped for the next while. Um, I think it's really important that we not be left behind, that we are not the ones who are, we are not the budget item that yeah. gets deferred over and over and over again. Accessibility is not a luxury and it's not a privilege. It's a right and it's a necessity. Um, and okay. I just think we just have to keep pushing. Yeah, we need to keep pushing and keep doing the good work. Yeah, that's amazing. And uh, I really like the fact that you brought up universal design. Uh, because that's what we try to promote here uh, at the Chicken Model. It's very important now to push for universal design so everyone who lives in the city is able to live, probably live, and probably work, and probably explore the whole city. And I know with the buildings that are already in the city, the city is really, really old already. Uh, 
They may not be possible in some buildings they're already built. We're obviously going to do what we can to make it more accessible. But I really think for now going on here um, from this point, any new building or any new commercial or residential building when being built should have universal design as the number one stuff. I completely agree. Okay, well, um, now the last question I had for you, um, and I think I already know the answer. Uh, well, what, what exactly brought you to uh, Access for now? My desire to actually get to know my peers in the disabilities community and to see if I could play any part in helping us as a community um, assert our rights to full inclusion in every aspect of society. Um, and just to get to know some folks who, with whom I share a common experience. Right on. Well, we definitely grown a lot more than we ever did. I ever thought we'd grow, and I'm, I'm really happy to have you as part of the Accessible NL community. Uh, I believe uh, just from you alone, uh, I've learned a lot about people who uh, are seeing impaired. So I want to thank you for coming on to the show. And uh, you are, as usual, a wonderful guest. And uh, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you for this opportunity. And I just wanted to say to everybody, we can do this. We're just going to keep at it and uh, transform St. John's. Cheers. Sounds good. Thank you again, Anne. I see you made it to the end of the video. Why not help us out by hitting that subscribe button and commenting down below to let us know how we did. And I'll see you in the next video.